so when I'm looking at the curriculum, what I, what I like to teach and what I tell people at my seminars and I tell people in my classes is I only teach fundamentals. And to me, SBG, the, our, our epistemology, our training method is about aliveness. Our curriculum itself is about the fundamentals of fighting. Um, all the different ranges, but when I'm talking, whether I'm talking about jujitsu or clinch or stand up, I'm talking about fundamentals. And so the question that often comes up, I get asked all the time, is what is a fundamental? And the way I explain it, in, in as simple as terms as I possibly can, is a fundamental is what's most important. It's not what's most basic. So it is the most important things that define a delivery system. And not only that, it's going to be something that we all need to know how to do. And we're all going to do in a very similar way, at least if we know how to do it efficiently. Every different black belt in jujitsu has their own, his or her own style of jujitsu by the time they become a black belt, their own setups, their own sweeps, their own submissions. And I believe when teaching a group that what you do is pretty much irrelevant. What matters is what all those black belts have in common which is the kind of the, the skeleton of the structural framework that allows them to compete at that level of fundamentals, the fundamentals that Hodger Gracie shares with Marcelo Garcia or whatever. That's what interests me. Those are limited, they're finite, they're super important. The depth of them is beyond what I think most people imagine. I've, I've been doing jujitsu now for almost 30 years and Every year I realize more and more about how much I don't know about the fundamentals. I've been teaching full time for 25 years. And each year that goes by, I'm like, I had no idea that something like an UPA or a technical standup, things that I would consider fundamentals of jujitsu, how deep those things can run. The moment he goes to lift his hips, he affects my base so he can defend himself. So that's the upper body. But notice lower body, I still have my hooks. So I have better control, my big toes are touching. And when you're mounted, your feet should always be pointed inside like that, okay? Like I'm gonna cross my feet over. So ideally, ideally he would have the inside here too. So he gets his legs flat like that. Now, if his knees pointed up a little bit, no, you can have it flat, but up, yeah. There's a little bit of space here. You're gonna see this more when I teach the elbow knee escape. There's a little bit more space where I can get my foot. And by definition, people who are good at holding mount are good at doing this kind of stuff. That's why they're, they can hold mount. They're good at, at um, building wedges underneath your body, okay? So if he points his knee out, flat as you can get it, but he turns it a little bit. So his kneecap's pointed that way. Not so much that it lifts, but just there. Hard, maybe hard to see with the gi pants, but that makes it harder for me to get my foot underneath. When I revisit a talk, topic like mount escapes, what I'm trying to do is find to go through a kind of a process of alchemy, if you will, where I'm boiling it down to just the core essentials. So the, the things that everybody needs to know how to do that we're all gonna do kind of the same way. And I'm looking to find the most efficient way to do it and then run groups through it and test test it and then pass it along as part of the curriculum. And, and I do that every year and this year we're gonna go through mount escapes. And I think I have a really good curriculum. I was pretty proud of what we laid down on film. And I think the progression that I show it in, the, the movements and the details that I show it in will allow anyone, whatever level, white belt to black belt, they're gonna be able to change their game if they drill that material. What happened is my weight, my hips, now on the back of his ankle and his calf. Very difficult for him to get the arm out. But the other nice thing is I've accented the angle, right? Not only have I gotten my ear out of the way, but I've turn my body a little bit that opens up this angle even more. And the last step, 12 o'clock, right? And watch how little I need to move to get him over when you have the right angle. Now, he's mounted, good receiving posture, puts a hand in the collar. I grip, I do one at a time, to get my elbows down and I get here. All that's done, I shorten the side, I look to 12 o'clock. If I have a good connection and good angle, there's nothing Ray can do with his upper body that's gonna allow him to stay on top. I will, you will always roll them, okay? If he can use this hand and post and stop, your angle is wrong. No matter what he does with this arm, if you have the correct angle, it won't work. Watch, I'm gonna go slow, and he can try and stop me with his head, with his hand, however he wants, okay? It's just not gonna work. Starting about five or six years ago, I went to 
pick one topic per year that I would teach. So in, the, in all the years past, I've been doing seminars for about 20 years. But for most of the previous years, I'd do a weekend seminar and I'd have maybe four subjects, right? A little bit of stand up and then three or four different aspects of jujitsu or clinch. And I decided I wanted to just stick with one subject for a couple reasons. For, for myself, it gave me an opportunity to try and revisit the fundamentals of jujitsu and, and redo a curriculum and go through everything. So that was helpful for, I felt for myself and for the organization, but also it gave me an opportunity to work in, in such a way that by the end of the weekend, I felt like people that took the class, my seminar could see measurable difference. When I'm going from topic to topic and I have, you know, two hours to cover something, you don't see that remarkable of a difference. But after two days of just focusing, for example, on mount top, low mount, a very specific type of mount top, which is the first year I did this. By the end of the seminar, people were holding mount top completely. They had a to totally different experience. So that was satisfying as a coach to see. And I think it's satisfying for students. And it, it, it lets them understand that if you're training the right way and with the right focus, you actually can make a measurable difference in your game in six hours of training. And, and so that's why I started doing it. Uh, last year was supposed to be guard passing. But the truth is I only taught that seminar once because of COVID. So everything got shut down. And normally what happens is I'll teach the seminar. By the time December rolls around and we film my yearly subject i've taught the seminar probably 24 times at least in a row and each time i've taught it I've, I've made a change or a slight difference and by the time i get to the end of the year i feel like i really have a, a, a solid curriculum that i like and i did not get even though i've been teaching that style of guard passing for five or six years and, and you know doing jujitsu for a long time i didn't get a chance to go through that process with 24 different groups around the world the way i normally do so instead of doing guard passing, I went back and visited a subject that I've been kind of personally working on myself the last couple of years, um, which is escapes from mount. If she tries to wrap it, like she tries to use her arm to wrap it, go again real slow. It's, all, it's not gonna work, it's all strength, right? It's hard. So instead, nice and slow, same thing, and then freeze. She brings her elbow up. Now she just brings the elbow straight down and then she can capture my arm. Okay, so this is one of the things when we're pummeling, the way you capture the arm is like that. So that's the first piece. Thank you. Here's the second thing that would happen to me. I would bump, bring him forward. They go to wrap up the arm, but he pulled his arm out already, right? So Ray bumps and brings me forward. There's nothing preventing me from just lifting my hands back off the mat. So then the question is what? Is it speed? Are you supposed to be faster than they are to make it work? So we have to solve that problem by making them put the weight, their weight into their own hands. Fundamentals is, is what's uh, most important, not what's most basic. I have a, a few things that define what fundamentals are. So for example, fundamentals will transcend venue. That means it, it, it'll transcend gi or no gi or MMA or self-defense. Uh, fundamentals will transcend bodies. So if you're 130 pounds or you're 260 pounds, male or female, fundamental is a fundamental. They'll transcend era. Uh, if it's the most efficient way to do something now, then we go back to the time of the Egyptians, it will still be the most efficient way to do something then. It'll transcend geography. And the way I try and explain that to people is if I said to you, we're gonna teach Canadian geometry or Japanese calculus, you would know right away that something was wrong because geometry and calculus transcend culture. And so does grappling. You know, we are, we're a bipedal primate. There is the most efficient way to, to grip somebody or to cut off the blood supply to somebody's head. And once we locate that most efficient way, it doesn't matter what culture, what continent you're on. So, and it transcends era, it transcends geography, it transcends culture, it transcends body, and it transcends, you know, uniform or venue. So I'm flat on the ground, and then I just go and shoot my hips up. There's space between Ray and I, and a lot of the, the, my pressure, a lot of my power gets lost because there's bad connection, okay? So first thing I do is I, as I tilt my, flatten out my back, I'm also lifting my hips slightly off the mat. Not a lot, right? But a little bit. And now I'm connected to his base. Here, how does that feel? Right when you do it, I feel on the back of my hamstrings. I feel like you're going to move me. Yeah, but right here, you feel comfortable, yeah? Mm -hmm. No connection. Here, yep. different, right? And now as soon as I make a movement, I can bring him forward and affect his base. The moment he gets up just to here, that's all gone, okay? 
So everything I'm going to show you in the, in the next videos coming up is dependent on you starting here. So there's no special street mount fundamental escape. The, what you're going to do to escape in a parking lot, mechanically, the core of what you're doing is going to be the same whether you're in a gi match in the gym on a mat, which is going to be the same if you're in an MMA cage with gloves on. There are strategic differences. There are things that we pay attention to that in no way means that those those uh, theaters of operation are the same. What it means is the skill, the fundamental skill that you need that serves as the engine that drives your ability to escape in those different venues is the same. And that's, that's what I'm looking for. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm always trying to teach. And that's what I encourage the other coaches and SBG and the other gym owners to restrict themselves to, because I think that the moment you veer away from that, when you're teaching class or you're running a gym, you actually begin to restrict the student's creative ability. And when you, when you really limit yourself just to fundamentals, you'll find that in a very short period of time, you will have a mat of blue belts and purple belts who all have completely different styles. And that's beneficial as well. You'll have true merit, meritocratic diversity because you've taught them based on the fundamentals, not based on what you do or don't like to do. Uh, get into an elbow knee escape. Just watch my body, keep going. Good, so freeze. That's a lot of movement and energy on his side and none of it transferred into my body really. I'm still just sitting here where I was. My base is unaffected, right? And Ray, to be honest, come back. He's doing a very uh, efficient elbow knee escape. Most often when I see people do even black belts is they'll begin by getting on their side. So do this. And then they begin the whole thing from here, which is even worse because it's got all this, where, where did that go? <laughs> Not into me, right? You had all this movement and it didn't go into me. I think that what differentiates the way I teach and what we do here at SBG is, is a lot of the things I've just articulated in the sense that we, we are a group of coaches who are constantly sharing information with each other and applying a scientific approach to functional martial arts and looking to improve them year after year for our students and for our athletes. If somebody is looking for something new, quote unquote, a brand new way to escape that nobody's ever seen before, I'm not the guy for that. You, you have YouTube for that, you can go to that. If you're looking for what the, whoever's the number one guy in competition right now in the last 12 months has done, in terms of, I'm not the guy for that. There's lots of stuff like that on YouTube as well. But if you want to know a good solid look at what the core fundamentals are of the delivery system and a, and a practical logical progression that you can take someone yourself or your students through that will make a measurable impact in one class, then you're probably going to want to look at our product. And if you like fundamentals, if you appreciate fundamentals, then I think you will enjoy not just what I do, but what all the coaches here at SBG do. And uh, I put a lot of years of years of thought and trial and error and experimentation and uh, learning go into each of the products that we put out. I'm freeing and the first thing I'm doing is going kneecap down, toes down, because otherwise he'll come back underneath, right? If I go like this and I keep my kneecap up, he's right back under. But first thing I do is go here and then I go here. Now try and get your foot back under. It's very, very difficult. And then I can easily feed. And again, from there, it's all about hip movement. Not, even though I can push his leg down there because it's light here, I still want to make sure I'm getting my hips in. Sometimes that's harder. So come back. He's being a little trickier. When I go here, he's shadowing me. And so now I, I need to use one foot to help untie. So what I like to do is really just put one foot on the heel back here. And then I'll kick it out like that. Okay. Now as I switch, I go back. Short answer, everybody. Product is for everybody that likes functional martial arts. Long answer is, um, and I'll give the same answer when I teach seminars, which sometimes annoys some of my hosts where they say, well, you know, can we do like a beginner class and an advanced class? And if that's what they're doing to break it up to market it, or because for example, when I go to Ireland, the groups are so large, you know, John has to have a way to, to separate the mat out into different pods that I, I completely understand. But the reality is anybody that's taken my classes 
gets the exact same thing. So if I'm teaching a, a class full of white belts or I'm teaching a class full of competitive black belts, my curriculum doesn't change. Uh, the things I emphasize don't really change. The only change you'll probably see is a change in the intensity of the drilling that we do, where I might dial it up or down based on what's gonna be productive for the athletic level of the group. But the material never changes. So I say classical just the way it's typically taught is here. This is really where, where it's happening. Why? If I go like this right now and I say, um, shrimp and move your hips that way. Why is that hard? Well, because I want to, I want to move this. Through. Well, you're, you're shrimping into his weight, yeah. right? Ray's heavy. The bigger Ray it gets, this guy's 310 pounds. It's going to be that much harder, because Ray's sitting on his knees. His knees are heavy, so you can't move your hip back that way. If I tell Ray to put 90% of his weight in his left knee, now shrimp that way. Now it's super easy, right? You can shrimp the, so. So what makes the shrimp work, what makes the elbow knee escape work when you, when you do it properly like this, if somebody's really in tight, is the transfer of weight. You're taking their weight from 50-50 and you're putting all the weight where you want it to be and then you're shrimping, you're moving into where they're light, where the weight is not, okay? So to do that, he's gonna use his elbow. You are a, a black belt that's been doing jujitsu for 25 years and you said, what, what would, I, and he, they came and said, can you show me what to do from Mount Bottom? I'm gonna show you what's on the curriculum that we just laid down on, on video. If you're a brand new white belt and says, I wanna learn how to escape Mount Bottom the right way, what do I need to work on for the next couple of years? I'm gonna show you exactly what I put down at, just now on video. So, so in that sense, I think it applies to everybody. It's gonna be the same thing for small women or large men, heavyweights. If you're looking to do MMA, the materials going to be the same and we address strikes in the in the video so I'm not just talking about gi or no gi or or with punching we even talk about it from a self-defense aspect the things you you need to to pay attention to so while I address all those different venues I think you'll see by the time you somebody watches the end of the product that the material is essentially the same and if you develop that skill set in your body, then you can transcend venues. You can play around with strikes. You can try an MMA fight. You can take the gi on, or put the gi on, or take the gi off, and you're still going to have your skill.